I like to play role-playing games. I also like to play war games. So the two tend to occupy the same space in my brain. And I guess because my first entry into really gaming of any sort was through RPG, I try to incorporate RPG into a lot of my gaming. It just feels like the natural thing for me to do. I think for a very long time I thought of war gaming, both before I played it and for a while after I played it, I thought of wargaming as if though you are the general, as the player, you are the general of your army. You have a sort of a god's eye view of the whole battlefield because you're getting constant updates from your soldiers on the ground and you're controlling the different squads or troops or regiments and telling them where to go and what to do. But for me, as a, a sort of role player by habit, I tend to willingly fall back on role playing tropes, like when there's an enemy squad lying in wait in a bunch of ruins, and my squad is about to go into that building. In my mind, I think, well, my squad wouldn't know that there's an enemy squad in there lying in wait to ambush them, so they'll go in anyway, because that's what the role player would do. But a war gamer would never do that. They see the whole battlefield and they use every piece of information they have to their advantage. It's a strategy game. You do not make decisions based on what the characters are thinking. But what are you going to do? A role player is going to role play. So I often think about how it's possible to add a little bit of role play into a war game, especially since the two hobbies are so closely related. RPG, role playing games, came from war gaming traditions, and so it seems like they should be compatible. Well, often part of that experience for me is choosing a character within my army to be my character quote-unquote. The one whose eyes I'm seeing the battle through, even though I'm also playing the general of the army with a god's eye view of the battlefield. Here's five tips to help you roleplay a single character in your war game. Before I get into the list, I'm going to add a caveat. This assumes that you're playing war games casually and that you and your opponent are equally invested in the roleplay aspect of that war game. If you're the only one interested in roleplaying in your war game, things could get a little bit confusing because it will probably seem like you were just trying to take advantage of your opponent or blatantly cheat by not having a character die when they run out of wounds. So keep that in mind. This is casual. This is friendly. All players need to be on board with the role play. One, know what role playing means to you. The phrase role play in wargaming has some special context. In an RPG, players tend to think of roleplay as the act of speaking the words that you imagine coming out of the mouth of your character. Some serious role players even feel the emotions that their character is experiencing. I don't think a war game can stand in for that kind of role play, but I do think a war game is a spot on implementation of, say, video game level role play, or the role play you get from, like, a solo game book like Lone Wolf or Combat Heroes. Speaking of Combat Heroes, I play through one of those books on this channel, so go check that out if you're curious. When you role play in these media, you control the actions of a character. You make choices based on what you feel your version of this character would believe to be best, and you track the character's progress across individual adventures by leveling up skills and attributes and so on. You're not walking in the character's shoes, though. You're more or less pulling the character's strings. Keeping that in mind can help you know what to expect when you try to add a little RPG into your big battlefield war game. Two, immortal but not immutable. So let's say you pick out a miniature from your army and decide that that's your character. You give it a special name, a backstory, you make note of any special weapons and loot, and you can hardly wait to see what your character finds in a loot box during the next battle. Then the day of the big battle arrives, your character is literally leading the charge, or at least that was your intent, until your character steps on a landmine in round one and is removed immediately from the board. Okay, so to make up for an insta-kill, you can decide 
decide that your character is maybe uncommonly lucky or just plain immortal. Pragmatically, that means you get to follow this character through a bunch of battles no matter what, and in game terms, it means that when your character steps on a landmine or gets shot at, then the damage goes to some other soldier within your character's squad. It's a common trick, it happens all the time for special miniatures that you spent a lot of money on and just don't want to see off the board quite yet. Whether or not you have a threshold for just how immortal your character is depends on you. If losing death as a consequence of your action spoils your immersion, then you can rule that your character dies when damage affects your character's squad, but there are fewer soldiers to absorb the damage than there is damage to assign. In other words, when an enemy battalion opens fire at your character, the shots that hit first remove soldiers all around your character, and once all of those are gone, then they start hitting your character. After a battle that your character has survived, either by just being immortal or by letting a friend take a bullet, you, you ought to reflect the battle on your character sheet, though. If your character should have died, but for the sacrifice of unnamed red shirts, then do the right thing and give the character a permanent injury, or destroy your favorite weapon, or don't take the XP you'd have otherwise earned. Conversely, when your character took no damage and rescues a puppy, reflect that on the character sheet. Reward yourself for that. Don't force yourself to conform to a game trope that forces you to continually invent a new hero and reset your emotional connection with your character and possibly the game. I've made that mistake before out of an imagined obligation to see how the game plays out, quote, honestly, unquote, but in extreme cases, I've lost interest in games because I lost my favorite character. In retrospect, it would have been much healthier for me and the game and our relationship to do whatever it took to keep my character. It's what we do in most video games, so why not on the tabletop? There are lots of alternative game mechanisms to death, so use them. A common trick I use is to just tally up how many times my character really should be dead. You see me doing this in my Combat Heroes video. Whenever I die, I just increment the death count. When I play a game and look back at it and see that I've only d died two or three times, then I pat myself on the back and I think, okay, that was a well done game. Whereas if I look back and I see that I've died 18 times, then I think, okay, yes, technically I could have done better. I don't feel bad about it. I just use that as a metric for how I performed during the game. Call it an alternate timeline, call it immortality, call it whatever you need to call it, but keep the character you care about. 3. Hero Points Unlike in a role-playing game, war games have one or two or three wounds usually, or health points or, or life points, whatever the game calls them. The assumption is that you've got lots of soldiers to soak up damage, so each soldier only lasts for a few hits. It's also arguably a lot more realistic. Getting shot once very frequently is enough to finish someone off. But that's not how it happens in the movies, and that's what we're really after. You don't lose the main character of a movie five minutes after the opening credits. You don't lose the main character halfway through, or at the end. The main character is, is impossibly resilient, essentially a superhero or demigod. It's the same trick role-playing games use, and actually some war games for certain characters. Roll a d6 at the start of each battle. Assign that number of extra health to your character for the duration of that battle. I don't know, call them hero points. This is riskier by nature and by design. Your character isn't immortal, just more durable. When you roll high for hero points, your character might take a few extra risks. When you roll low, your character might play it a little safe. But even the best plans can't withstand actual gameplay, and using this method, there's still a good chance that your character could die. And if that's the kind of on-the-edge-of-your-seat gaming experience that satisfies you, this could be a really good way to balance a boring character that just can't die and the potential of losing your character to literally one lucky shot. 4. Unreliable Narrator Hey, you're Snake Plissken, ain't you? What do you want? I thought you were dead. Says literally everyone when they meet Snake Plissken 
in John Carpenter's Escape from New York. You can use this trick in your game. It's the trick of rumor, hearsay, and unreliable narrators. Just because you got a report saying that your star soldier fell in battle doesn't mean your star soldier actually fell in battle. War is hectic, people get confused about what they see, wires get crossed, reports are muddled. When you remove your character from the board during a battle, it doesn't mean your character died, it only means that the character is missing in action. If you enjoy a little bit of tension, roll a d6 after after the game. On a 1, your character is actually dead, but otherwise your character turns up at headquarters, a little worse for the wear, but still alive and ready for the next game. Who knows, maybe even play a quick skirmish game about how your character gets through whatever mess they got themselves into. 5. Tag Team. In some games, there are effects that can remove a character or a miniature from the board, such as a trap or a temporary condition. The effect means that your character is not on the battlefield. It doesn't mean that they've died, it simply means that they've been caught by a snare, or that they've been indisposed, or kidnapped or incapacitated in some way. They are not dead, they simply missed this particular battle. I like this system and use it in a couple of different games, and it forces me to switch over to a secondary character, temporarily, while the primary character is in recovery for whatever reason. But then I get the primary character back on the next game. I do this with Middle Earth Battle Strategy game a lot because that's a group of characters that I'm very, very familiar with. So switching from sort of playing as Gandalf over to playing as Frodo or playing as Aragorn is pretty easy. It's a pretty fluid switch. So if you've got a couple of characters that you are particularly attached to or fond of, you could treat it like that when one dies or gets removed from the board for whatever reason, they're not dead, they're just not at that battle at this time. Maybe they got hit, maybe they're playing dead, maybe they're unconscious. For games I really, really love, I have to admit that part of the joy is getting to play lots of different characters in that game world. It's kind of a great excuse to pick up another one, adopt a new play style according to that character's backstory and stats, and get back in the game. Regardless of which method appeals to you, there are lots of options for roleplay in a war game. This video has been about how to manage your character in a war game, but there are techniques for roleplay in a war game or strategy board game that can help make that roleplay easier. I've done a separate video on that, so check that out. Thanks for watching.